I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Calm down. Get a hold of yourself. Stewardess, please, let me handle this. I've got to get out of here. Calm down. Now get back to your seat. I'll take care of this. Calm down. Calm down. Get a hold of yourself. Doctor, you're one on the phone. Everything's going to be all right. Sister, please, I'll handle this. I've got to get out of here. Out of here. All my bags are packed, I'm ready to go I'm standing here outside your door Hate to wake you up to say goodbye The dawn is breaking, it's early morning The taxi's waiting, it's blowing, it's home Already I'm so lonesome, I could cry So kiss me and smile listening to that twilighty show about that zone please send a man round back and pick up miss liz powell a part-time stripper and full-time looney tune who has checked herself into a health care facility run by dr smith before he became lost in space after her convalescence she'll board a big old jet airliner and wind up back in the past in queens new york for a world's fair like no other in the twilight zone Please enjoy 22 and The Odyssey of Flight 33. Again, these episodes have numbers in their titles. Weird. So we have two episodes that are personal favorites of mine. I love these episodes, and yes, they do have numbers in their titles. I remember posting on the Twilight Zone Facebook book group asking how many people could name episodes with numbers in their titles. I got a lot of responses. Oh, yeah? How many? Uh, I would say probably about 30, 30 or 40. Awesome. Because a, a lot of these titles do have numbers, <laughs> even if they're not written out. You know, Sometimes they're the number, and sometimes they're written out like 22 was. Uh, it's, it, it, now, 22 is based on an urban legend, essentially. The teleplay by Serling is um, from a short story by E.F. Benson, which in turn inspired an anecdote by Bennett Cerf. Bennett Cerf was the originator of urban legends. He was the guy who came up with all the crazy stuff, like, you know, and there on the handle was a hook, and he was in the house the whole time and all that stuff. Oh, I didn't know one person was responsible for all that. Yeah, it was a book called Famous Ghost Stories in 1944. So we have proof right here. That urban legends are not necessarily true stories, just simply a kind of Mandela effect. Have you heard of the Mandela effect? Um, I've heard of it. Um, but names and places change, and generation after generation, those people that started the legends were merely telling stories that were fabricated by other people. So somebody like 50, 60 years ago just made up a story. And then as you tell that story to somebody else, somebody else tells that to another person. And then as we go down the line, maybe 20 years... People swear to God it's a true story. Really, like I, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I'm cynical, but I don't. Like for I instance, don't know Babe really... Ruth, uh, you know, hitting a home run for a sick kid. I've I've read for years that that was true. It turned out it wasn't. 
just a little legend. <laughs> I thought by nature of the word of them being legends that we knew they weren't true. They're kind of like myths. They're just fun stories to tell and repeat. But you're saying that people actually believe them. So this is this is news to me. And that is the difference between an urban legend and a story. The story is, you know. A story we know. It's not true, but a legend some people believe. A legend people believe. Okay. We have curvy stacked act- actress slash stripper Liz Powell, played by Barbara Nichols, in uh, the hospital, uh, basically citing exhaustion. Do you, do you think that meant drug overdose or nervous breakdown in those days? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe that was like a little euphemism for that. But um, tell, so can you tell me anything about Barbara Nichols? Because as we were watching, it's really bugging me. She seems so familiar to me. She has this uh, Judy Holiday accent from that movie. What was it? Um, Born Yesterday, I'm thinking. But she was in a movie called Human Duplicators with Hugh Beaumont and Ralph. Ralph. No, no, I'm sorry. Not Ralph Nader. George Nader. <laughs> George Nader. It's a weird um, mistake to make. And Richard Keel. Hmm. And that was a great science fiction movie. That's not where I've seen her. I guess I'm not going to find played, out right now. <laughs> I, I, uh, George Nader is an interesting story uh, in and of himself. He was uh, he was uh, basically, I guess, to his friends and his family, openly gay. And he had to hide his homosexuality from the studio. And unfortunately, they found out and fired him in the old Tommy Kirk fashion where they find out. And then he spent the rest of his life having to do B-movies and stuff like that. Wow. Liz seems a little off. She seems a little flighty. That was a pun. <laughs> She's a little nervous. She or... keeps having these nightmares where she wakes up in the middle of the night, breaks a glass, which seems to trigger something in her to get up, walk down a dark corridor, take an elevator, go down to a certain floor where the morgue is kept, room 22. The creepy nurse opens the door, looks at her and says, room for one more, honey. She screams, runs off, and then she wakes up. She keeps having this dream. <laughs> Room for one more, honey. This is Miss Liz Powell. She's a professional dancer. She's in the hospital as a result of overwork and nervous fatigue. And at this moment, we have just finished walking with her in a nightmare. In a moment, she'll wake up and will remain at her side. The problem here is that both Miss Powell and you will reach a point where it might be difficult to decide which is reality and which is nightmare. A problem uncommon, perhaps, but rather peculiar to the Twilight Zone. Have, have you ever had a recurring dream? Because I, I don't think it's normal. Um, no, I've never had a recurring dream, but I wouldn't say it's not normal. I've, I think other people have told me that they do, just because it hasn't happened to me. I, I, I did. I remember having a recurring dream. That maybe lasted for a couple of weeks when I was about 10 years old. Uh, for some reason, I dreamt that I had a, I had a skateboard. And I had a dream that I, I used to get on the skateboard and I could fly. So I was basically balancing on a skateboard, flying through the air. And I remember being not terrified at all by it. By sure. It was really Sounds awesome. awesome, actually. But, I mean, it's just like a, it's an item. It's a device. It's not really part of the dream. It's just sort of my... My equipment, my gear, whatever I had. I, apparently, in any particular situation in a dream, I always had a skateboard that I could get on and somehow make it fly. This is a great setup because the repetition of the nightmare sequence and oddly the shot on video aesthetic works in the story's favor this time. I had a problem with the bulk of the videotaped episodes because I felt like they looked cheap and stagey. And many of the actors were not accustomed to this kind of shoot. But this episode was directed by our buddy Jack Smite, uh, who had directed... Night of the Meek, another video installment, and he he also directed Damnation Alley, my one of my favorite movies with George Pappard and Jan Michael Vincent, and I think he does a really great job with this one. Yeah, I agree. It's one of my favorites and one of the run, ones I can remember uh, seeing when I was a child. I, in fact, I remember being about like eleven or twelve, going over to a friend's house for like a sleepover, and we were watching Twilight Zone late at night, and this episode came on, and we were it was just like I don't know, it was just thrilling. I think we all got like as excited and nervous as. Uh, as the lead character there. I think that's where that comes from, the urban legend, because this seems like something that, this seems like a story you could tell somebody. Oh, I knew this this woman who kept having this crazy dream about visiting a morgue, and the name of the room was 22, and then she she's about to, you know, and uh, well, I won't spoil it yet for everybody, but it has that kind of repetition of an ur- urban legend. So Barbara uh, alerts her doctor and her manager to her nocturnal adventures, but they think she's just a baddie female. Dr. Smith in particular, that's Jonathan Harris, 
is a very smarmy, weird, inappropriate doctor with her. It's pretty shocking he's a doctor entrusted to uh, <laughs> care for sick people the way he is. So he keeps leering at her and he keeps like, oh, you're so attractive. Oh, you know, it's just because he's... Oh, the pain. <laughs> oh, the pain. It's just because he's uh, the lost in space doctor. He can't help himself. Well, this is a couple of years before, but I think when they were looking for like uh, a weird, inappropriate guy, they probably looked at this episode. Now let's run through it again. You say it always happens in perfect chronology. You wake up, you feel thirsty, you reach for the glass, you hear the clock ticking loudly. Very loudly. It unnerves you. The glass slips out of your hand and breaks on the floor. And then I hear the footsteps outside. Footsteps? Whose footsteps? Miss Powell seems to feel they're the footsteps of a nurse. They are the footsteps of a nurse. I hear them. They come down the corridor and stop outside my door. I jump out of bed. Now, Miss Powell. I open the door, and I see this nurse going into an elevator. I follow her. The elevator goes down to the basement floor. Down at the end of the hall, there's a room. Room 22. What kind of room? It's the hospital morgue, Mr. Canada. Miss Powell seems to feel that the nurse comes out of the morgue, looks straight at her and says... Room for one more, honey. Uh, they put a lineup of nurses in front of her, but none of them are that particular nurse, played by the beautiful Morticia and Adams stand-in Arlene Martell. All of these nurses are short compared to the statuesque Martell. Uh... I believe her overall height is somewhere between 5'6 and 5'7. She is rather tall, I guess. I never noticed. What can you tell us about Arlene Martell? Um, well, gee, she keeps turning up in things I've been watching lately because uh, I'm doing all these uh, recaps of the monkeys, and she was in two of those episodes, one in the first season one in the second. And how, how tall is she compared to Davy? <laughs> uh, I, you know, well, she looks like she's about a foot taller than in her, in her heels and all that. Um, so I was surprised you said she's only five six or five seven, but it must be the heels because she looked as tall as most of the men in that cast. And also, we also saw her uh, recently on an episode of The Man from Uncle, right. playing a spy instead of playing an innocent little waif. She's she was a, the, yeah. a badass spy on that. She was a, show, a, so she right was on. an employee of Uncle, right? She? She yes, with them. she was an employee of Uncle, and she was their equal. She was an equal to Napoleon and Ilya. Uh, very beautiful woman uncommonly beautiful for the time because she would be what you might consider multi-culty these days she has a kind of look about her that doesn't scream american right it's probably why they cast her on star trek right that's the one thing i noticed yes she played spock's uh intended uh wife or something and she does a really good job in that episode too she was always very popular at star trek conventions we cut to a few days later and liz is being released from the hospital her manager gets her a ticket to a nice tropical locale to rest and strip presumably <laughs> because he's always thinking about his 10 percent. to rest and strip i like it or strip and rest we don't know what she gets whatever to the order. airport yeah. finds out her flight number is 22 but she's cool she gets on the tarmac, goes up the stairs, and who does she see getting people on the plane? <laughs> Remember the old George Carlin joke? <laughs> get on the plane, get on the plane. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you, I'm getting in the plane. Let evil Knievel get on the plane. I'll be in here with you people. <laughs> Stewardess, sorry, flight attendant, Arlene Martell, who promptly says, room for one more, honey. Barbara freaks and runs off. She goes back into the airport in hysterics. The plane takes off and explodes in midair. She's kind of saucy for a flight attendant, don't you think? I don't know if I'd get on either if someone approached me like that. It's, it just, <laughs> she looked one problem. that way. You know, the thing about Arlene Martell in this episode, you can't really see her kind of, um, I don't know, what's the word, swarthy features. I, I don't know. That's what I was thinking. I was she just has thinking... this goth thing about her. She's like a goth, sexy nurse. And then she's a goth, sexy stewardess. <laughs> Because they give her this deep lipstick that just really... And they also do something with her eyes. I don't know. Maybe they give her a little bit of eyeliner and they really pluck out her eyebrows so that they are really standing. And then they give her these really prominent eyebrows. And I think it's all part of the makeup. So it's, it creates this weird effect on her. I 
don't know. She's pretty striking. I think she looks pretty extreme in some other things, too. But not just that, but she doesn't exactly have a warm, inviting vibe. Let's put it this way. She seems pretty sassy, as I said, in bo- both in the as the morgue nurse. And, I, and I know you love Carolyn Jones, uh, but she sorry, totally could attended. have nailed it as Morticia Adams. She really could I have. do love Carolyn Jones. She stepped out like Morticia <laughs> Adams in one of those monkeys episodes, right? Right, in the... Or Vampira, maybe. I in don't the know. monstrous monkey mash. But anyway, yeah, and like I said, my thoughts on this episode. It's great. It's completely memorable. It's because it's got a relatively simple plotline, and all the acting is is right on. I mean, we were sort of making fun of Dr. Smith there. He's, he's kind but... of... He's a little bit over the top. I mean, like I the think... director said... He said, Jonathan, when you play this character, I really want you to just make everyone uncomfortable. He's like, oh, I can do that. Ooh. After watching years of films and TV show, I think over the top is always preferable to boring. Well, big. I, I guess big. Big. Big is good. That's and, sort of like, you know, Shatner and everything like that. Right. You know, everybody people, gets on William Shatner and they make fun of him a lot. But really, if you look at the acting of the time, it was very big. The Odyssey of Flight 33 almost picks up where 22 leaves off. We end in an airport and we pick this one up in an airplane getting ready to land. Uh, there were a few episodes of Twilight Zone that took place in airports and airplanes, but we're right here in the cockpit. Yeah, well, this one, that probably taps into people's fears, right? I mean, you're afraid of flying. Lots of people probably are. So it makes sense to put it in an airport or an airplane. Only, I mean, this was 61, so right. that wasn't that many years before you had to wind up the propeller <laughs> and get into this thing and wear a, wear a ridiculous leather helmet with goggles and everything, right? Not too long past the Wright Brothers. When, were we, uh, when uh. were we... Starting commercial flights, probably in the 50s, right? Mm. After the war, when industry started booming, we started building aircraft that could actually hold more than a few people and doing these commercial airline flights, right? Yeah, sounds right. So this was still a relatively untried technology. (laughs) Okay. This episode aired February 24th, 1961, written by Serling, directed by Justice Addis. Uh, A a little bit of a trivia here. Nerd alert! Uh, Serling's brother... Uh, was flew in the war, and he was a commercial pilot. So he gave Serling a lot of advice on certain things, like a lot of the a lot of the crazy jargon and slang that they're him, talking about. He was a technical expert. Is yeah, that he was saying? a technical. I believe his name is Robert Serling. Oh, that's handy. So we're going London to New York, long flight over the Atlantic, but something doesn't feel right. Instead of slowing down, the craft is gaining acceleration. It's getting faster. Well, how are we doing back there, Janie? All your passengers are highly content, but on behalf of the stewardesses. I would like to respectfully request that we get to New York as soon as possible. One's going to the opera, two have heavy dates, and the fourth is available to any honorable and single male crew member. Oh, hold on a minute. You feel anything? Feel anything? No, what do you mean? I don't know, I felt something. Something funny. Like the sensation of speed. I can't put my finger on it. I guess I'm getting old. True airspeed 470, we're level. You suppose we picked up a tailwind? Yeah, maybe those jet streams are tricky. It's that crazy feeling I can't shake. You can't feel a tailwind, but I, I feel something. There's a little bit of early 60s slang at work here. The stewardess, sorry again, flight attendant, refers to a heavy date. Uh, I turn to Bronwyn as we're watching this, and I ask, what's a heavy date? She shrugs. She doesn't know. So I look it up. Uh, This is the definition. It's a planned meeting between two people who are very interested in having a romantic or sexual relationship. (laughs) Who are very interested. See, that's very polite. You made it sound like it was definitely specifically a one night stand, but now you read the ins- that description doesn't necessarily. Well, can sound can like you that. say horny stewardesses? <laughs> it's basically a hookup. It's a booty call. And surprising that this kind of language was used. Heavy date really does it. It, it sounds stronger than than actually sounds stronger than hookup. Yeah, I mean when they said it, it sounded to me like just a serious date, like you some, know what I thought going was? out with someone that you're serious about, but you're saying something else. I so. thought that the stewardess with the heavy date well she said we have we have two heavy dates she was like talking to the to the guys in the cockpit okay like, so, how, so how are the girls doing back there because back then it was only girls that got hired for that job well right. two stewardesses are having and she said stewardesses are having heavy dates now what i'm thinking is is that as soon as they land in new york their long-term boyfriends are going to ask them to marry them that's what i was thinking oh was okay so heavy. i was being sweet about it but apparently yeah. this is very lurid <laughs> Um, so I know flight attendants are very crafty. <laughs> that was a pun. 
But yikes, everybody's anxious to get back home to New York right away. The plane goes to hell. The airplane breaks the sound barrier, which is over 3,000 knots, if I'm not mistaken, and then they wind up back in the past. Everybody thinks they're going crazy because they see freaking dinosaurs out the windows. The captain, who is played by the great John Anderson, surmises as a result of breaking the sound barrier, they've traveled backward in time to apparently the Mesozoic era. That's what I would think, wouldn't you? Especially since those dinosaurs were oh so realistic looking. Well, I, you know what? That was ILM for 1961, okay? <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's just that's one of those strange things, the view from 2016. It kind of looked like Land of the Lost, but in black and white. <clears throat> I, you know, there's a bit there. The, the, um, I'm not sure if the visual effects were actually created for the episode in particular, but there's a bit there where the dinosaur actually looks up at the airplane. And, yeah, yeah. And I goes, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you know, he's going to get his other uh, dinosaur buddies over. Like, Rudy, Rudy, look at that metal bird up right, there. Right, right. They would be just as surprised to see it. Sure. The co-pilot is played by Paul Comey, who was in the first season episode. People are, are like all over, co-starring Roddy McDowell. Sandy Kenyon appeared on several episodes of Twilight Zone. Among them, uh, The Shelter and Valley of the Shadow, Hart McGuire and Wayne Heffley round up the cockpit crew. They don't call it a cockpit anymore, do they? They call it the flight deck. They don't? No. Oh, that's news to me. It's got the word cock in it. I really like this episode because it's an unusual narrative. We pick up the story in mid-action and end before there's a resolution. So it's like nonstop suspense and it's very well acted. There's lots of panic. What's the score? We've been circling for a half an hour. They said they'd keep in touch, but not to come in. Well, what do you think, Skipper? Well, we've flown over what should be Schenectady. Albany points north. I'll give you a surmise, gentlemen. You may want to trust me up with ropes, but it's the only single explanation I can give. Somehow, in some way, we not only went through the sound barrier, but we've gone back in time. Well, what do we do about it? Skipper, fuel is down to 49,435 pounds. Then here's what we're going to do about it. We're going to push this baby up until she's going as fast as she can. We're going to climb until we get back into that jet stream, and then and we're going to try to go back where we came from. The, the captain decides to break the sound barrier again, which they do. Meanwhile, the passengers are starting to freak out because there are dinosaurs. Uh, they go through the sound barrier again. They try to contact Idlewild Airport, but it isn't there. They reach LaGuardia, but it's just a small runway at the time with the tiny little tower. Um, there's a bit of a slip up here. Uh, as we are told that New York's World's Fair of 1939 is going on. Uh, there was no LaGuardia Airport at that time. There was, however, an Idlewild Airport, which had just opened. But it would later be renamed after John F. Kennedy. So I don't know why they didn't just switch the names when they were working out the story, unless the trip through time somehow changed everything. How about that? <laughs> I didn't, maybe they just didn't uh, look into that. But uh, here's some trivia. Uh, Fiorello Henry LaGuardia was an American politician. He is best known for being the 99th mayor of New York City for three terms from 1934 to 1945 as a Republican. Only five feet two inches tall, he was called the Little Flower. Fiorello is Italian for little flower. That's just adorable. Yeah, it's kind of, um, you, you're looking to get like beat up in the school. Yeah, I think with maybe. A name like that, mm. Fiorello. I mean, it's cute and all, but it should be Fiorella for a, for a girl or something. Fiorella. Let's change Regan's name. Too many uh, syllables. So yeah. what did you think of it? I mean, it wasn't that memorable to me. And what you're saying, they sort of didn't, have a resolution or much of a beginning i mean you're saying that you liked it i, I just didn't really like it at all i felt like it, there wasn't much to it there wasn't much story wasn't much beginning or an end you didn't see um, how this was inspirational to say like stephen king um langoliers is very much like this story except it, yeah it, langoliers builds on it and then it gets really silly and then it gets really weird well but i think that that it might work okay for a short story that you're reading but for something that i'm watching in 30 minutes no it didn't really worked for me. It seems like they were trying to do a lot with a little, which is okay. I mean, I'll, I could also say that about the other one we were talking about, but in that case, they managed to make it a little more entertaining. I, this one just Well, I mean, did it, seem, it has something in common with that first episode we talked about, and it has the air of an urban legend about it. 
it's a little bit like, you know, did you hear the story about the people up in the airplane? They broke the sound barrier and they went back in time. Nah, I don't know. That doesn't. I have Doesn't sound like. Anything. I mean, it's not eerie coincidences or anything like that. It's just. It just seems like something you tell people, like a kind of story you tell people around a campfire. I just. I wish it had been maybe developed a little bit more in some way. And you know what it was like? It was like it was a concept. The concept was interesting, but it just wasn't developed any further than that. I like the way it leaves it off, though. I like that we don't have a resolution because we don't know. Did they live? Did they die? Did they? Did they go into the future, like, too much? Did they wind up in 2016? I don't know if I wanted a resolution, but I just wanted, like, a different kind of a kind of tension besides it's just sort of like, well, this thing happened. Isn't that strange? And that's all I got out of it. This is Mark Giacoma in a well-received cameo. What happened was David didn't write his tag for this episode at the time he recorded it, so he's making me record it. Next week, David discusses the episode's Mr. Dingle the Strong and Static, with yours truly, Mark Giacoma. Until then, please try not to have recurring dreams, or else you'll wind up on a plane that travels back in time, and you'll have to deal with dinosaurs. Good night. Good night.